So here we are out in Edwardsville, Illinois for murders four and five, November 3rd of 1977 to Arthur and Vernita Goosewell. So the backstory to this is Barbara Boyle had an apartment above Dr. Engelman's mom's house that her and her three kids lived in. She had married a dentist, didn't go so well, got divorced, and her being a single mom, never having a job, stay-at-home mom, wife, was having trouble making ends meet. Well, her and Dr. Engelman became friends, and he would help her out from time to time. Well, he got to thinking again, and told her of a way that they could both make out with some good amount of money. So, his plan was find a hardworking man, marry him, get the insurance policy, and I'll take care of the rest. So that's when Barbara Boyle met and married Ron Goosewell. He was a hardworking man, worked at an oil refinery out here in Illinois, but he lived on the property of Arthur and Vernita Goosewell, his parents. They had a 600 acre farm that was doing really quite well. So when Barbara and the kids moved out here with him, she saw dollar signs. So like Val said, Barbara did see dollar signs. She also saw a big picture. And the discussion between her and that monster, Dr. Glennon Engelman, was that she would have Glennon take out Ron's parents, Arthur and Vernita. And then Ron and his brother would inherit a 600 acre farm that was doing really well worth about $600,000 and split it right down the middle. So Glennon decides he's going to take on that challenge and job, dress up really nice in a nice suit with a briefcase. He put a 22 caliber handgun in the briefcase and some rope. And he also got his friend Bob Handy and they drove all the way here to Edwardsville from St. Louis. The original plan was that they were going to just make it look like a robbery gone wrong and Engelman tie up Arthur and Vernita and then ransack the house. But I think Engelman actually got excited, like overly excited. And he ended up shooting Vernita execution style and then also shooting Arthur execution style and forgetting to tie them up. Now Vernita actually passed away but Arthur didn't. But Engelman didn't know that when he left. So Arthur regains his consciousness finds his phone and calls 911. And that's when you hear on the phone to the 911 operator, Arthur saying, I've been shot and my wife's been shot also. When police and EMTs arrive, Vernita was pronounced dead on the scene. And they took Arthur to the hospital where he ended up passing away but before he passed away he murmured and mumbled there were two there were two so now we're to murder number six Ron Goosewell, March 31st, 1979. So we had just talked about Barbara seeing a big picture and having two parts to this inheritance. One part was to take out Ron's family, Arthur and Vernita. 
mom and dad. And then they would inherit about $600,000 worth of a successful farm. And they would have to split it with Ron's brother. And that took about two years in probate to get everything all squared up. So part two was now the insurance money that Barbara took out on Ron, plus Ron's inheritance. She called back up her friend, Glennon Engelman, that monster, and came up with a plan. The plan was for Glennon and his friend Bob Handy to meet Barbara at a truck stop, get into her car, and have her drive home with them sitting low in the back seat and in the, and in the front seat. So it would look like just Barbara was coming home and nobody else wouldn't be suspicious. When they got home, Glennon and Bob hid in the garage and they waited for Ron to come home. Barbara made a phone call to Ron and said, hey Ron, can you come home early from work? And Ron was like, yeah, that's fine. I was gonna go out with the boys, but I'll come home, no problem. And they waited. So when Ron pulls up into the driveway, he gets to the garage door, opens the garage door up, takes one step inside the garage and Engelman shoots him in the chest. And to make sure that Ron was deceased, Bob Handy took a baseball bat and crushed his skull. Now, they direct Barbara to go get towels and anything to clean up the mess so that there would be no evidence. While she was doing that, they take Ron's car, which was a Camaro, and they put Ron in the back seat with a trash bag over his head. And Ron was a bigger man, so it took the two of them and they couldn't quite get him into the car easily. So they broke one of his ankles to the point where almost his foot came off just so that they could fit him into the back seat. And they drove his car to East St. Louis, which was about 20 miles away and dumped his car in a hotel parking lot. And we're gonna go there now. So come along with us to that parking lot. and Bob Handy got Ron in the back seat of the car. They left the house. They went back by the truck stop, picked up their vehicle. That's when Bob followed Dr. Engelman to where we're at now. Now we're in East St. Louis, Illinois, where Dr. Engelman would park the Camaro over here on the west side of the parking lot of the old Coleman's Plaza. 
Well, the vehicle stood there for five days till anybody investigated it. Upon investigation of the vehicle, they found Ron in the back seat with a plastic bag over his head, and they found condoms in his pocket to make it look like a prostitution gone bad. So now at this point, Barbara has a little legal battle to handle. Ron's brother Richard didn't believe that Barbara deserved any of his parents' wealth. So of course he took her to court. Well, Barbara won. So upon getting Richard's part of the farm and the $190,000 in life insurance that she had taken out on him, she came out about a half a million dollars ahead. So here we are at 3500 South Grand, South St. Louis. We're in the back parking lot of the building where murder number seven happened, Sophia Barrera. And her backstory of how she got with Engelman was, she owned a dental laboratory and Engelman would send his denture impressions to her. Well, he was not the best dentist and when he did his impressions and would send them to Sophia, they had a lot of imperfections. So her people would have to work harder at getting these right for, for the patients. Well, of course she was gonna to have to charge him extra, which Dr. Engelman didn't like. He didn't like the fact that he got charged more money than other people. She tried to explain to him it was all because of having fixed the problems. Well, after time, Engelman wound up owing Sophia $15,000 and she had been nice about waiting to get the money and at, at some point she decided to get a lawyer and to sue Dr. Engelman for this money. So after Sophia hires her attorney to get the $15,000 back from Engelman, Engelman thinks that Blowing Sophia up is the best course of action. And that is so insane to me that that would even be a thought. But in Engelman's case, it was. He grabs a trash bag, puts a bunch of dynamite in it, and sets it up against her garage door at her residence. Luckily, there was a boy passing by who was curious in what was in the bag. So... He opens it up just a little bit to see that he didn't want any part of it and he got out of there. It rained that evening so because the bag was slightly opened everything inside got wet and when it was time to detonate it malfunctioned and it barely even made a mark on the garage door but it surely sent a message to Sophia and she actually dropped the lawsuit against Engelman for a moment. But a few months later, she got the courage again to hire the attorney back and go forward with the lawsuit against Engelman. Monday, January 14th, 1980, Sophia would be coming out of those doors right there and into the back parking lot not knowing what was ahead of her and what was ultimately going to be her fate. So at 4.45 p.m. on that Monday, Sophie leaves her office, comes into this parking lot. Now this isn't probably the actual parking spot, but you get the picture. Her 1975 Pinto was parked in this parking lot. As she gets into the car and puts the car in reverse, dynamite that was placed underneath her front seat blows up and the whole car is destroyed. Now this part's going to get gruesome. Uh, if you don't like that kind of stuff, I 
suggest that maybe you fast forward a little bit. But Sophie was found hanging out of the driver's side window in her car. Her bottom half was completely gone. The explosion was so large that body parts and pieces were all over the place. And even her steering wheel was actually found on the roof of this apartment building right here. That's quite a blast. They said that the buildings had shattered windows. It looked like spackle all over the apartment complex of body fluid and pieces. They even found one of her ears that still had her earrings in. And they found one of her feet with the stocking still on it. It's just an amazing, an amazing event that happened here. And it was so gruesome that the police and the fire men had to block off the whole street because there was about a hundred people out here onlooking, wanting to know what was going on, wanted to see Sophia, wanted to see them extradite her out of her car. And once they did and put her on the stretcher, they say that it looked like only half the stretcher was needed. So, how did we get here? We're in Jefferson City, Missouri, at the Missouri State Penitentiary, ultimately where Dr. Glennon Engelman ended up. So, Engelman marries his third wife, April 15th, 1967. Her name's Ruth. They have a child together, a son named David. But in 1980, Ruth, for fear of her safety and her son's safety, tell law enforcement everything she knows about what she and Dr. Engelman had discussed about all of the killings. Police tell Ruth, that's great, but without Dr. Engelman confirming the things that you're saying, none of it's gonna hold up in court. Is there any way that you can wear a wire? Ruth reluctantly agreed. Over the course of time, Ruth ended up getting Dr. Engelman to confirm the murder of Peter Holm, the murders of the Guzwell family, and also the murder of Sophia Barrera. And because of that, it ended up getting him convicted. Now in Illinois, he gets life without parole for those murders, those killings. In Missouri, he gets life with the possibility of parole after 50 years. And from what I understand, he makes a deal in Illinois to be able to serve his term here in Missouri. And that's why he ended up at this penitentiary. He ultimately dies of diabetes, and that was March 3rd of 1999. I believe he was 72 years old. So he ended up serving his life sentence right here in Jefferson City, Missouri at the Missouri State Penitentiary. All right, the monster, also known as the killing dentist, Dr. Glennon Engelman, is over. So what did you get out of this experience, Val? So for me, I've, I've heard several podcasts about him, 
and to know that the sick and demented guy was here in our St. Louis area that we live in is scary. But to see the places that these tragedies took place, it really brings it home for me. Yeah, I mean, I was inspired by watching a Netflix documentary on serial killers, wondering if St. Louis had one. And I researched and found the killing dentist. And uh, this has been a great experience going to all the different locations. I've learned a lot. Have you learned a lot? I have. So we also hope that you've learned a little bit. We want to thank you for coming along with us and experiencing this with us. And we want to thank you for Jay and valing around with us.